the shooting range. In this episode, the King Tiger and what they wanted to do with it by the end of the war. The A-26, how the Americans were creating the famous Boston's younger brother hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the AMX-30 B2. How to play this French MBT. The test of the French ground forces is finally over. All the players now have unlimited access to the whole tech tree. Of course, we'll be adding more vehicles to it as well as to all other countries. But for now, let's talk about the current top tank of the 5th Republic, the AMX-30 B2. Since it's the top vehicle, its BR is as high as 8.7. And the armament corresponds with that. The tank is armed with a 105mm weapon, the CN-105F1, and carries 47 shells for it. The reload rate is also very good. 7.5 seconds between shots will keep you firing at a very good tempo. The only thing that fires faster is the T-64, and the advantage is less than half a second. And of course, at this BR, the players expect to find a lot of cool ammo to fire from this gun. And what they expect, they find. The APFSDS shells pierce 346 millimeters of armor from 100 meters, and HEAT shells penetrate 360 millimeters from any distance. And if you'd like to try another approach, you can also pick some smokes and HE shells. Next, the armor. What do we have here? Okay, <clears throat> let's change the subject and talk about, say, the chassis. The tank moves quite fast. In a usual off-road situation, as your engine will boost you up to 44 kph out of a maximum of 65. You can try and go even faster, but those tricks heavily depend upon your environment. The reverse speed is also very acceptable, 27 kph. The acceleration rate can cheer you up as well. So one of the most efficient tactics while driving this tank would be to find a good cover, shoot, hide, reload, and repeat the whole process until you run out of enemies. Just remember to shoot only from an absolutely still position, as the engineers of this tank didn't think about putting a stabilizer in. The turret is quite nimble. It rotates at a rate of 30 degrees per second, which is at least faster than the turrets of the T-64A and the T-55. You'll also become very fond of four smoke grenades and an extra 20mm gun that will ease your fight against some light-armored vehicles, even at medium distances. Now, let's talk about tactics. As you might have understood, your armor won't place you in a winning position. <laughs> well, who needs it anyway? You've got your agility and a bloody big gun, so use them wisely. Of course, you can capture points, but we recommend doing that only if nobody else can. At the beginning of the battle, try to find a good position from where you can control those points and access routes to them. Don't hesitate to use some decorators if you have them, and remember that trenches, hills, and other natural hideouts are still your best friends. If you've already destroyed everybody in sight, and the others for some reason don't rush to meet you, then okay, leave your position and flank the enemy. Never use a direct approach. And remember that most of the time, you'll only have one shot per opponent. In the comments section under the previous episodes, you've asked us to tell you about the adventures of the King Tiger by the end of the war. Well, let's do exactly that. The 
there is a whole layer of alternative history with fantasies on a common theme. What tanks would the Germans have used should the war have continued into 1946? A shorter name for this topic is Panzerwaffe 46, and it has a lot of stories, fictions, and suggestions. For example, they say that the Germans needed just another year to replace the Panthers and the Tigers with the E-Series tanks, and after that, they would introduce the E-100 and the Maus. Those would become perfect rivals for the IS-3 and the Centurions. It's time to find out what was really going on there. Germany did indeed have an emergency plan on building tanks at the end of the war. The problem was there were no E-Series tanks in it. What was then? Let's figure it out. Using the example of the most powerful serial tank they had, the King Tiger. In autumn 1944, the Third Reich approved its last program on tank production. They were in such distress that nobody even thought about building some Wunderwaffe weapons. The production line consisted of only three chassis types, the light Hetzers, the middle Panthers, and the heavy King Tigers. All the SPGs were to be based on those. The idea was to unify the standards of the vehicle and, by doing so, increase the number of the produced tanks and simplify their maintenance. The outdated Panzer IVs and Stuger III's were about to be taken out of production. All of that meant that by 1945, the Germans only had one heavy serial tank, the King Tiger, and it was going to stay for a while. But if it was almost perfect when it came to armament and frontal armor, it had a lot of problems with its weight. With a mass of almost 70 tons, the chassis couldn't hold it anymore, and the tanks were breaking down all the time. Also, they had to limit the engine power to 600 horsepower. They needed a new, reliable engine as soon as possible, and they found one when the Maybach company offered its 900 horsepower mortar called the HL234. They almost didn't need to change anything in the tank to install that one, so they planned to issue the new tanks by the August of 1945. But in reality, by the end of the war, the engineers weren't even able to finish the stand trials. There was an alternative, the S1A16 engine by Porsche that was already tested on the Jagdiger, but the monopoly of Maybach was too strong for Porsche to expect an order from the government at that moment. They needed to change the transmission as well. It had been created for a tank that originally weighed 36 tons, and now it couldn't function properly. For example, it heated up so much that they had to cover it with something for the driver not to burn himself. The ZF company offered their transmission created for the Panther, but it wasn't reliable enough. They were never to solve this problem. Well, at least they were content with the armament, right? Of course, there were some ideas. By the end of 1944, the Krupp company presented a number of more or less insane projects on refining the German tanks' armaments. Some of them suggested rearming the King Tiger, for example, by installing a 105mm gun. But they ditched the idea, as this option would heavily decrease the fire rate. So the only thing they did approve was installing a range scope. The new tanks were supposed to be produced starting July 1945. The whole thing doesn't sound very super powerful, does it? It turns out that if the war would have continued, the Germans would have had the same King Tiger, except with a new engine, transmission, chassis, and a range scope. And that's the best case scenario. As for the E-75 project, they cancelled it as early as 1944 without even finishing it. In the end, they would never have had the answer to the IS-3 at all.
It took some serious courage to fly the A-20, but when the enemy heard it in the sky, they couldn't be anything but frightened to death. That is, until they met its younger brother, the A-26. The A-20, made by Jack Northrup and Ed Heinemann, was popular all over the world. They loved it in America, in England, in Australia, in France, and we're not even talking about what the Soviet pilots managed to squeeze out of it. But it had some flaws. For example, the aerodynamics were calculated based upon the standards of the late 30s, and the crew members weren't able to fulfill their comrades' duties when any one of them passed out or something. Also, it was impossible to install the new 18-cylinder radial engines as it would demand the creation of a whole new wing, and a new wing basically meant a whole new aircraft. On the other hand, Sooner or later, they would have to create one, wouldn't they? Then, why not now? With that in mind, Ed Heinemann started developing a new plane right after he became chief aircraft designer of the Douglas Company following Jack Northrup's resignation. Based on the A-20 concept, the new multipurpose strike aircraft had a laminar flow wing adopted from the Mustang, remote control guns, and two high-performance engines from the Thunderbolt. Usually, nobody would even think about repurposing the production line during wartime. The new planes would perform a bit better, that's true, but the production speed would drop spectacularly. But when the military command saw the new A-26 going up to 600 kph at the first altitude zone, they went completely wild and demanded it to be immediately mass-produced. They started inventing terms of reference with such enthusiasm that the orders could change several times a day. First, they needed the A-26 with four air cannons, then with six machine guns, then with eight of them, then with a bloody 75mm anti-tank weapon. Once. They even ordered a nighttime fighter modification of the A-26, but luckily, Jack Northrup was already creating his P-61. All those new requirements weren't very funny to follow. After a very short time, Ed Heinemann found a way. He simply created an easily replaceable nose cone and a wide range of interchangeable options for it. Here you go, military gentlemen. Treat yourselves as you like. You've got choices with six and eight machine guns, four 20mm cannons, and even four 37mm cannons from the P-63 King Cobra. And just in case, let's put six more heavy caliber Brownings in the wings. Still not enough? Okay, let's add four machine gun pods with a couple of guns in each. Now you've got yourselves a plane with at least 14 Brownings and four tons of payload options. Is this aircraft offensive enough for you? By the summer of 1944, the first invaders got into service in Europe and in the Pacific. The success was a lot wider than with the Boston. With that much firepower, the attacking A-26 could turn anything and anyone into piles of burnt and mostly dead bacteria. But the real rage of this machine became clear when it caught up with a Messerschmitt 262 jet and destroyed it. Its pilot was so eager to ground the bloody Super Boston that he lost a lot of speed chasing it and then couldn't get away. The acceleration rate of the early jet engines was a lot worse than that of the Thunderbolts. After the war, the invaders served in French colonies frightening guerrilla fighters in Algeria and Indochina. Then it went to Vietnam, where it proved to be as useful as the newest supersonic fighters with guided missiles. But when it came to strike helicopters, the A-26 was repurposed as a firefighting aircraft, and it serves this purpose even now, alongside its older brother, 
the A20. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question was asked by a user called Thomas Barr. Will there ever be a single-player tank campaign? Supporting infantry, escorting convoys, attacking cities, it would be great. Pretty much, yes. It's in the works. Can't give you an ETA, though. The second question comes from a player called Dogbot. Will there be aircraft carriers in naval battles? Hi, Dogbot. The gameplay on the aircraft carriers isn't such fast and totally isn't much wow. Those are quite serious reasons why we don't plan to introduce them. At least, until we figure out how to make them interesting for the players. A player called Vessel Grenlund asks, Can we expect British light tanks come up in the future? Yep, you can. As we've said before, we're not done with the British yet. Then there is a question from David N.K. Can you add naval air realistic battles? Because I don't want to be a naval aircraft on Stalingrad map. Hi, mate. That would be a no. There are some naval locations in the usual air RB mode, but you can check them out in custom battles if you like. As for creating a standalone mode that does exactly that, well, compared to other things we're working on right now, it's not a priority, to say the least. And the very last serious message comes from Andre Targa. Am I gay? Please answer. Yes, I use Spitfire. Hey, Andre, you surely look like one jolly fellow, so why not? Have a gay old evening, my friend. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.